Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you an unusual true story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. And here is our distinguished host, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Shakespeare said it best. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that taketh. It is an attribute to God himself, the quality of mercy. On the courthouse lawn in the city of Galesburg, Illinois, there is a statue, a woman kneeling beside a wounded soldier tendering aid. It was set there to honor the memory of one of America's first and greatest nurses, a woman whose qualities of mercy and courage were as durable as the stone of the statue itself. Her name was Mary Ann Bickerdyke, and this is her true story. And now here is Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. Whenever you want to remember a special person on a special day, let Hallmark Cards speak for you. They are the symbols of friendship, and they can carry your thoughts right next door or half a world away. And here's something nice to know. Even though the quality of Hallmark Cards improves through the years, their prices remain the same. So look for the Hallmark and Crown on the back of each card you choose. It always means you care enough to send the very best. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with Metro-Golden-Mayer, producers of the Technicolor picture Mugumbo, starring Clark Gable and Ava Gardner with Grace Kelly. And now Mr. Barrymore brings you tonight's exciting story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Summer, 1861. The Civil War has just begun. The armies of the North and of the South march toward each other. There is a carnival air about them, as though a holiday and not a war had been declared. <laughs> no one believes it'll last longer than a month or two. A bit of shooting, a great deal of cheering, and then, and then truce, and conference, and compromise. So the soldiers sing and crack jokes, and there are sightseers with lunch baskets, and speeches, and hilarity, and bouquets of flowers in the musket barrels, and then... Bull Run! And the other first great horrible conflict, each leaving in its wake the inevitable trophy. In the fields of battle, the vast moan of the wounded goes up and is heard, among other places in the land, in Galesburg, Illinois. And at the home of the Reverend Mr. Jackson, one morning... He's the Reverend here. Oh, Mary, I, I thought it was... The... Come in, come in. The Reverend, is he here? We're waiting for him at the depot, the whole Ladies' Aid Society, but he has... Oh, excuse me, I ran all the way. Is he here? Yes, he's here, but... the but... train leaves in a few minutes. You'll miss the train. Is that the doctor, Ethel? Doctor? Is Mrs. Bikerdyke? Uh, have her come in. Have her come in. He tripped on the steps just as he was leaving. He's broken his leg. Oh, Reverend. Didn't you... Get my note? I sent a boy to the depot. Uh, sit down, Mary, sit down. I'm so sorry. Are you in great pain? Well, I would be if I weren't so angry with myself. Of all times for such a thing to happen. Well, well, the Lord moves in mysterious ways. Now, this is what I've done. I've sent a message to the freight agent telling him to unload all the crates and keep them at the depot unload. for such a time as... But those supplies are needed at the hospital. Why, you told us yourself of the misery you'd seen down there in Cairo. You... I'm... I'm sorry. The authorities never dreamed there'd be such a great number of wounded. They're totally unprepared. The confusion is unbelievable. 
We cannot ship those supplies unattended. They might be shunted onto a siding and lost for days, if not forever. Now, I've sent for Mr. Morrissey. Perhaps he can find the time to make the journey if he leaves by tomorrow's train. Tomorrow's train? Reverend, there are boys from this town who have bled to death in Cairo for lack of bandages. Every hour's delay means suffering and lives lost. We... Oh, forgive me, I'm upset. Yes, yeah, so am I. I'm just as anxious as you and the other ladies of the AIDS Society to waste not a moment in bringing... The warning, the... Reverend, the supplies must go by that train. Impossible. You can see I'm in no condition to travel, and if no one else is prepared then to... Then I'll go. go. What's that? I'll go. But you're a woman. Are these the invoices and laden receipts? Mary, did you hear what I said? You're a woman. I've traveled alone on railroads before. But you've never in your life seen anything like the hospital in Cairo. It's a nightmare, a charnel house. It's no place for a woman. No, no, it's out of the question. I won't I will go not... near the hospital, I promise you. I have less courage than most when it comes to things like that. Ethel, tell him what I did when you cut your finger while we were nailing up the crate. She got sick to her stomach and had to be walked in the air. So you see, you've no cause for worry on that score. I'll simply deliver the supplies and come home by the next train. Mary, I beg you to reconsider. Goodbye, Reverend. Back. Ethel, will you look after my house while I'm gone? Don't worry about it. Mary! Mary, wait! Mary! This woman, Mary Ann Bickerdyke, traveling south to the Army Hospital in Cairo, Illinois, is 43 years old and the mother of two grown sons. A quiet woman, almost shy. She's never done anything out of the ordinary, nor considered herself to be other than average. It's night when she arrives in Cairo, raining. She steps down from the train into a hurly-burly of darkness and hurrying overworked men. How many more in that car? There's three, sir. But I think one of them's dead. We've run out of stretchers. I'd use blankets. Carry them out in blankets. I'm begging the lieutenant's pardon, but where am I supposed to get blankets? I can't weave them, you know. Excuse well, me. Then sir. just carry them Excuse out. Excuse me, yes, but I'm the here. The devil are you. What's a woman doing here? I, I represent the Ladies' Aid Society of, of Galesburg, Illinois. What? And I... Madam, I don't know how you got here, but I do know you don't belong here. These yards are off limits to civilians. We're unloading wounded. Yes, it's precisely because of the wounded that I've come. There's a freight car on this train with crates of blankets and food and bandages. Uh, and... Yeah, let, let me see your pass. Car proof on your landing. No, I have no pass. Madam, I, I'm, I must ask you to leave at once. I intend to leave just as soon as those crates are delivered into the proper hands. You see, we of the Galesburg Ladies' Aid... Please, uh, madam, I haven't slept a wink in two days. Now, we've unloaded 200 cars of wounded since nightfall. We haven't even begun. I haven't time or energy to waste on you. I'm, I must ask you to leave. Leave! Won't you just assign some of your men to unload the crates? I Corporal, even... escort this lady out of the yard. I will not go until those crates have been delivered. If you touch me, I'll smash you with my umbrella. Hear what I said, Corporal? I, I heard you, Lieutenant, but... Um... All right, Corporal, as you were. I'm going to headquarters to see about this. You keep an eye on her. She may be a spy. Corporal, won't you help me? Once those crates are unloaded, my work here is done, and I'll go. Well, I I'd like to, lady, but... Well, without orders, I'm liable to be broken down to a private. A lady, did you say you had food and blankets for the wounded in those crates? Yes, and bandages and socks and underwear and ever so many things. Well, except for the corporal, the rest of us as privates. They can't break us down no further. Right, fellas? How about it, Corp? Well, all right, but keep an eye out for the lieutenant. Oh, bless you. Here are the receipts and invoices. Come on, boys. Come on. When the supplies are unloaded, Corporal, will you see to it they're taken up to the hospital and distributed? Oh. Don't have to take it all the way to the hospital for that lady. She's wounded all around you. What? Yes, ma'am. They're stacked over there on the platform like cords of wood. And behind them, that, that whole hill is covered with wounded. They've got acres of them. In the open? In the rain? Well, we're putting up buildings as fast as we can, but... We never expected so many. Oh, Corporal. Lend me your lantern. Where are you going, lady? I'll be over there on the platform. There must be something I can do. Lady, please. Have you your must man open be. the crates as quickly as possible. And fetch what's in them to me. Lady, no. I, I got orders you to stay here. Lady. Then I'll help you. Is there anything at all I can do to help you? No. Let you know. 
I was just thinking about you. I was wishing you would... Oh. Who are you? I want to help you. Tell me how. Look, I'm, I'm awful cold. Well, there'll be warm blankets in a moment. In the meantime, we can use my coat. There. Is that better? Thank you, ma'am. Do you have any bandages? The chap next to me, I, I, I think he's bleeding to death. Johnny, Johnny, wake up. There's somebody here to bind up the wound. Ma'am, don't touch me. I'm powerful dirty. Oh, I'm sure I don't mind that. Now, I'm going to open your tunic. You tell me if it hurts. Oh, ugly, ain't it? I don't think we can wait for the bandages. Now, if you'd shut your eyes for a moment and you turn your head. Oh, not your petticoat, ma'am. I said shut your eyes. Yes, ma'am. It's funny. I, I shot Yank here and he got me with his bayonet and here's both of us side by side. And there's you. Be sure to tell me now if it hurts. We got the crates, ma'am, and they're open. Cover as many as possible with the blankets first. Then feed all those who are hungry and may eat. And then come back Here to... Here she is, Colonel. This is the woman. Your servant, ma'am. I'm Colonel Everly of the Surgeon General's Department. And I'm Mrs. Vicka Dyke of the Ladies' Aid Society of Galesburg. I'm not doing any harm here, Colonel. I'm trying to help. Yes, ma'am, I know, and I know the work of the Ladies' Aid. But I have orders that say no civilian is permitted to enter or remain in this yard. I intend to obey them. And I have orders that say, do unto others as ye would have them do unto you. And I intend to obey them. Quite so. Quite so. How long will it take to unload the supplies the lieutenant tells me you brought? They're already unloaded. Uh, well, then... But there seems to be more to be done here than I thought. I... Oh, I beg you, sir, since there are so many wounded, may I not stay a while and help? Very well, madam. And I thank you. I'll make out the proper papers for oh, you. Thank you. And could I trouble you to send a telegram to the Reverend Mr. Jackson in Galesburg? Tell him to keep the supplies coming. And tell him I'm no longer only a woman. I'm a nurse. Corporal, hand me some of those blankets. <laughs> In just a moment, we return to the second act of the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Did you ever stop to think that the Christmas card you select is really several cards in one? Because it's sure to mean different things to different people. For instance, to a new neighbor, your Christmas card may be a merry welcome to the neighborhood. To an old friend, it may recall other Christmases long ago. Yes, a Christmas card can be a wish for a bright future to a newly married couple, or a special holiday adventure to a small child or a warm bond of affection at Christmas time to someone across the miles. That's why the choice of your personal Christmas card is such an important one. And that's why I suggest you make that choice from this year's Hallmark Christmas card albums. In them you'll find all that's new and beautiful in the way of Yuletide greetings. New designs, new colors, new ways of expressing your best wishes to those who are dear to you. And remember, the hallmark and crown on the back of each card you mail will carry an extra measure of joy, for it means you care enough to send the very best. And now Lionel Barrymore brings you the second act of our true story of Mary Ann Bickerdyke. Such devoted, selfless nurses as Mary Ann Bickerdyke showing the way, the United States Sanitary Commission, the forerunner of the Red Cross, enlisted the services of other women. The organization grew. Before long, the hospital encampments such as the one at Cairo were fully staffed and efficiently run, and Mrs. Bickerdyke decided her work there was at an end. And one morning, she visited Colonel Everly at his office. Come in, ma'am. Come in. I'll be with you as soon as I sign these. 
There you are, Sergeant. That'll be all. Take this chair, ma'am. Now, what can I do for you? I've come to say goodbye, Colonel. I'm leaving this hospital. What's that you say? I'm leaving. I've already made arrangements with the Sanitary Commission. Someone will be sent to replace me. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. You're my good right arm. What will I do without you? I don't blame you. No one, man or woman, could work as hard as you've worked without wearing out. I've noticed you look a bit pale and drawn. You've earned a rest. A long one. Good of you to say so. Going back to Galesburg, huh? No. Colonel, have you studied the figures on the number of wounded who died during transport to this hospital? I, I don't follow your train of thought. Do you know the percentage of wounded who arrive here dead? Why, yes, I have the report here on my desk somewhere. It's 17 out of every 100. 17. Well, it, it, it's unavoidable. There are no trained personnel to care for them properly out where the fighting is done. I'm told heavy fighting has begun at Fort Donaldson. Casualties are bound to be high. If I could work in the field... Absolutely out of the question. Mrs. Bickard, I... Mary, get rid of that notion at once. That's what General Grant's headquarters said in reply to the telegram I sent yesterday. And quite right. You've never seen a battle. I have. The danger... Uh, I'll leave the danger to your imagination. But in the second place, we're not equipped to handle wounded in the field. Aren't you going to tell me I'm a woman? Well, do I have to remind you of it? Now, oh, Mary, use common sense. There are certain places that are not for you. That's what I was told when I left home to come here. Colonel, will you grant a request? Will you give me some sort of paper? Something that looks highly official. Something to help me hurdle the barriers between here and Fort Donald. No. I refuse to be responsible for such a mad action. And if you make any attempt to go there, I'll telegraph Grant's headquarters and warn them they'll march you straight back to Galesburg under guard. Would you do that? No. No, Mary... Promise me you'll be careful at Fort Donaldson. Fort Donaldson on the Cumberland. Midwinter. General Grant presses his attack with unparalleled vigor. General Buckner defends the fort with equal determination. And the snow between the lines is littered with the casualties. The night before the final attack... General John A. Logan of the Union forces makes the round of his section of the line. Ancient, as you were. How does it look, Sergeant? Pretty still until a minute ago, sir. Mm. Then Abe here thought he saw something moving out there. Oh, where? Point it out. And there, about halfway between the lines. We thought maybe they were trying to sneak up on us, but that's the only place Abe saw it, and there's not a sound. There's somebody looting. Of all the low-down sneak... Sergeant, send out a detail and fetch me the looter. I'll make an example of him. Bring him to my tent. Yes, sir. General Logan, sir. That you, Sergeant? Bring him in. Well, it... It ain't a him, sir. It's... What? Madam, what the devil were you doing out there? What are you doing within 20 miles of here when it comes to that? Who are you? I'm with the Sanitary Commission. Here are my papers. I was only trying to make absolutely certain that none of the wounded had been overlooked. Mrs. Bickerdyke, is it? These are the only papers you have? They weren't issued by this command. You're here without official permission. Don't you know this is no place for a woman? I'm a nurse. My place is wherever there are wounded. And I'll thank you not to shake your finger in my face. It's been a long time since I've been afraid of generals. I've taken the temperature of too many of them. Uh, 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 uh. That'll be all, Sergeant. You may go. Yes, sir. Let me see those papers again. Mary Ann Bickerdyke. Oh. You're here to look after the wounded before they're shipped to hospitals? So they'll live to be shipped to hospitals. Uh, sound, a sound idea. Um, can you do anything about patching generals together so they can get some sleep the night before an attack? Have oh, you been wounded? No, it's my shoulder, just a graze. But it's keeping me awake. Well, I'll have a look at it. And I have a powder that will let you sleep. Take off your tunic and your shirt. Oh, no, wait, no. Oh, worry. come, come. I have tended thousands of men. General Logan, I know I've broken a rule, but I had to. My request for permission to work here was denied. And I know... I denied it. I had no desire to encumber myself with an hysterical female. 
I was between the lines tonight for more than an hour and would have remained longer had I not been interrupted. Do I appear hysterical to you? <laughs> I only wish I had your composure when I find myself between the lines tomorrow morning. Well, there's to be an attack then. Mm. Oh, please, General Logan, don't send me away. Let me do what little I can for the wounded. I beg you. I'll grant you that permission, ma'am, but please, stay well out of range of firing. Um, we'll bring the wounded to you. You won't have to charge behind us. From that night on, General Logan was Mary Bickerdyke's best friend and most loyal adherent. He helped her stand up to Sherman and to Grant the many times she broke the rules to tend the sick and the wounded. For four solid years of war, she worked tirelessly, never sparing herself. On Palm Sunday, April the 9th, 1865, she was in Beaufort, North Carolina, when the word came that peace had been declared. Oh, Lieutenant, is it true? Is it over? Is it really over at last? Yes, ma'am. It's not just a rumor. It's finally over. Oh, thank heaven. Thank heaven. It's, it's really over. <laughs> no, I can't wait to be demobilized. Uh, what's, what's the first thing you're going to do? Oh, rest. Yeah. Rest. Lots of rest. Me too. Oh, uh, here's a telegram that just came for you. I almost forgot. Well, I can't find my glasses. Read it for me, Lieutenant. It's... General Logan, it says, Army of Tennessee on way to Washington, D.C. for victory parade. Short of rations, little food in Washington. Can you go there at once and prepare to feed my hungry men? Oh, dear. And it isn't over yet, is it? Shall I send a reply for you? Yes, please. Tell General Logan that the food will be ready when his army arrives. the food was ready, Mrs. Bickerdyke arrived in Washington eight hours before the Army of the Tennessee, and in those eight hours, she performed a miracle. She persuaded wholesale food dealers to donate whole warehouses of their products and a railroad to furnish a train to, to, to fetch the supplies to Washington. And a few days later, as the Army of the Tennessee prepared to swing up Pennsylvania Avenue in the victory parade. Your men look splendid, General Logan. Thank you, Mary. And so do you. Oh, that's a fine horse you're riding. Uh, it's a gift from General Grant. Isn't he a beauty? How'd you like to try him? Oh. Wait, just let me dismount. No, no, General, please. I haven't sat in the saddle for years. Well, uh, you're going to sit in one today. Major, help me up with her now. General, oh, no. Good. No. Oh, General. Thank you. There. Begin. I know, and you're going to be in it. You sit right there. If anyone belongs in the victory parade, it's you. Mary, I doubt if half the men in my command would be here today if it weren't for your efforts. Don't you worry about a thing. I'll be walking right alongside to take care of you. Oh, branches of our armed forces are the finest in the world. The most modern equipment, the most competent treatment, the most devoted care, the high standards achieved, the easing of pain, the saving of lives are in large measure due to Mary Ann Bickerdyke, who helped open the field of nursing to all women. Now, Next week, we are going to honor a man on the Hallmark Hall of Fame whose story outdoes the wildest adventure fiction you've ever read, because this story is really, really true, really happened. I'd like to tell you a little about the missionary on snowshoes in just a moment, but first, here's our friend, Frank Goss, to tell us something old and something new. Yesterday, I saw a collection of old English Christmas cards dating back to the 17th century. 
They were elaborate creations for the most part, trimmed in velvets or laces or nets. They were charming for their time, but I couldn't help thinking how much more we all appreciate the elegant simplicity of our modern day Christmas cards. Take, for instance, this year's selection of Hallmark Christmas cards in boxes. Among them, you'll find inspirational cards with messages by Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, or with the poetry of Edgar Guest. And you can choose from artist cards, too. Distinctive Yuletide paintings by Grandma Moses, Norman Rockwell, Hulda, Steinberg, and many others. So why not plan now to delight your friends with the kind of Christmas cards they'll be proud to display? Just buy several boxes of Hallmark Christmas cards soon, in assortments or in one style to a box. You can count on it. These beautiful boxed cards are reasonably priced and easy to keep together till mailing time. Yes, and once they're received, the hallmark and crown on the back of each will bring an extra measure of joy. For it says, you care enough to send the very best. And now here again is Lionel Barrymore. Say, you know, Frank, hearing you talk about the difference between those old-fashioned fancy cards and, and today's smart-looking Christmas cards, well, it, it makes me think of that old bromide about good old days and folks who always say how much better everything used to be back in the good old days. <laughs> well, that's nonsense to me, you know that. I, I, I like to keep up with the times. And you were right, Frank. When I was a boy, we couldn't get Christmas cards by famous artists like Grandma Moses and Norman Rockwell and and all the other famous folks who design Hallmark Christmas cards? Yes, and I, I like to see new Christmas art and new-looking cards. What are those uh, new, tall, thin ones, you know, that I like so much, Frank? You, you know the ones I mean. Oh, you mean the uh, Hallmark Slim Jim cards, Mr. Barrymore? Yes, that's it. Those are the ones. Well, say, Frank... Uh, what are you giving us a, a, a little preview, huh? Of the exciting adventure story we, we have coming up on the Hallmark Hall of Fame next week. Next week we're going to honor Sheldon Jackson and we're going to dramatize the story of his amazing and courageous feat, driving a herd of reindeer 1,000 miles across Alaska in the dead of winter to save the starving miners of Dawson after a torturous trip from Lapland by boat to New York, by train to Seattle, and boat again to the frozen Yukon. Yeah, yeah. Sheldon Jackson's saga of courage proved that Alaska could be tamed and become a powerful link in our American Commonwealth. Believe me, you won't forget the story of Sheldon Jackson. Hope you'll be with us next week. Remember, you're also invited to the Hallmark Hall of Fame on television every Sunday, starring Miss Sarah Churchill. Until next week, then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. For Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Our producer director is William Gay. Our script tonight was written by Walter Brown Newman. Marianne Bickerdyke was played by Virginia Gregg. Featured in our cast tonight were Margaret Brayton, Polly Bear, Lamont Johnson, Tom Tully, Jack Edwards, John Daner, Vic Perrin, and Lawrence Dobkin. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time when we present another true story as we honor Sheldon Jackson. And the week following, you'll hear the exciting true story of William Newton Byers, the two-gun journalist. And the week after that, our Thanksgiving Day story of Squanto the Cockney Indian on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.